Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I fight drum cases behind the lectern in a way that I've never had to do before, um, I think a sign of a, a, an inaugural lecture of a type that we've never seen before uh, here at Kiel. It's a very great pleasure to, to welcome you here to uh, this evening's uh, inaugural lecture by, by James. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Trevor McMillan. I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at, at Kiel. And uh, a, a particular welcome to friends, family of, of James. It is one of the features of such lectures that we do have a very broad-based audience. Um, and as I say, it looks like we're going to see something quite, quite different this evening. Um, it's not every inaugural lecture that I start with a sentence that says, James was a winner in the Daily Telegraph Young Jazz Musician competition at the age of 17. Um, he, uh, as in fact best improvising jazz soloist, um, and then he studied jazz at Berklee College of Music in Boston. Um, then he went into a career path that is more familiar in these lectures. He did his BA, MPhil and PhD at UCL uh, in London. And his research was on the metaphysics of consciousness, understanding how thoughts and feelings relate to brain activity. And that was under the supervision of Tim Crane. Um, he continued then for a little while at UCL as a teaching fellow while also lecturing at the University of, of Birmingham. Um, he then moved to Kiel in 2002. And apart from the research that we're about to, to hear about in different ways, he's received uh, student nominations for Teaching Word Awards pretty much every year since he arrived here. So again, I think a sign of things at, at Kiel that the interaction between research and teaching is, is still very alive and, and well. Um, he published a, a book on the American pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty in 2007. And I think that's one of the landmark publications for him because that book has become pretty much a standard text and has actually set the theme for much of his research and much of his publication activity over the period since then. In 2015, he was awarded a fellowship by the APRA Foundation in Berlin for a jazz philosophy fusion project. Now I think we're moving into where we're seeing this evening. And that was an original idea developed on various uh, independently released albums that he's released during that previous uh, decade. Um, in 2016, he published Philosophy in a Meaningless Life. And that was the product of almost 10 years worth of effort and work and actually was responded to by various philosophers around the world in a book that was published a year later in which he had the opportunity to respond to some of those uh, comments by other philosophers around the world. So I'm not going to say any more. So we now uh, are about to hear formally the inaugural lecture of Professor James Tartaglia. I'm going to tell you the meaning of life, a jazz philosophy fusion performance with live music. James. I'm gonna tell you the meaning of life. I'm gonna tell you the meaning of life and gonna cause no stress. I'm gonna 
Question of the meaning of life. Man, you really gotta ask about the meaning of life. Well, some folks say that the question ain't real, they need an education, they should come to kill. Well, is that a question we should hold at bay or should we get on our knees and start to pray? Well, some folks think that they know the answer and some think knowing is a life enhancer But the problem is when they all disagree they start to fuss and fight and cause misery But I'm going to tell you the meaning of life Yeah, I'm really going to tell you the meaning of life Well, don't worry folks, you won't be disgusted I got an answer with plenty of mustard tell you the meaning of life Well, I'm gonna tell you the meaning of life Well, I'm gonna tell you the meaning of life and gonna cause no stress and gonna cause no strife I'm gonna tell you the meaning of life Tell you the meaning of life. But y'all just have 
have to wait a little longer, my friend, because I ain't going to tell you to the very end. We have two ways of thinking about the world. One of them is objective thinking, and the other one is subjective thinking. These are both natural. These are ways that you are you all, all used to thinking about the world. So for example, you think about the world objectively, you think there are a number of physical things in front of you. People, rocks, pianos, elephants. Don't forget the elephants. And you think subjectively about the world, we all live through a, a stream of our own experiences, our consciousness. So you think about things as thoughts, as experiences. Sometimes you mix the two up. Supposing on your way here, you've got a bit of grit in your eye. Ow. And it's giving you some funny vision, okay? And you're looking at me now. And you can see a fuzzy red blur above my head. Okay? You're not going to think about that objectively. You're not going to think to yourself, oh, there's a fuzzy red object sitting above James's head. Okay? You're going to look at me, see me as an object, and you're going to think, oh, that's my experience. That's caused by the, uh, the stuff that I got in my eye. Now, metaphysics is the study of what? fundamentally or ultimately exists. Um, now, what do we mean fundamentally or ultimately? Well, what I mean by that is, were this fundamental or ultimate existence to be there, then all the other things would be there. Okay? So, give us the fundamental existence and you'll have people and chairs and elephants and thoughts and feelings. Okay? That's the idea. Now, within the history of philosophy... There are two traditional um, rivals. There is materialism, which is based on the objective way of thinking about the world. And there is idealism, based on the subjective way of thinking about the world. And both give us different candidates for what the ultimate reality is. The reality where, if you have that, all the rest of the stuff follows. Now, a funny thing happened in the 20th century. Around the 1950s, in the 1960s, people acquired a kind of metaphysical common sense. I expect most of you have this. You might not think of yourself as having metaphysical views, right? But um, materialism seemed to be the common sense view that people have. They thought that uh, people tend to think that Physical things, the atoms and electrons, which are studied by physicists, are the ultimate reality. So that if that stuff's there, then you'll have all the people, chairs, thoughts, feelings, banks, Brexit, all the other stuff. The idea that these fundamental particles studied by science are the ultimate reality. Um, and that's very much gone into common sense. But of course, as I explained before, to... to for materialism to be a rational view, right? Okay, it would need to explain the subjective. It would need to explain thought and experience. And the way that was attempted um, from the 50s and 60s onwards was to try and say that when we're thinking about um, thoughts and experiences, we're just thinking about matter, brain states, atoms, in a different kind of way. In a different kind of way. 
But of course, it's okay to say it's a different kind of way, but what people very soon realize is it's a little bit more than that. I mean, your thoughts and feelings don't very much seem like electrons or atoms or brain states or any kind of physical state, okay? Supposing I was thinking about one of those chairs down there as an elephant, okay? I had a different way of thinking about the chair. I thought about it as an elephant. That's not a different way of thinking about it. That's the wrong way, okay? The elephant doesn't exist. So this is the conclusion that, that the materialists came to, that the thoughts and feelings, they don't really exist. No consciousness, okay? Uh, but not just that, everything else based on the subjective way which we have of thinking about life. Freedom, we're not really free. We're just moving along in a motion which was determined from the beginning of time. The South, we have no South. It's an illusion. Morality, not really there. Love, the love you might feel for somebody, kind of an illusion. There are materialists today. Alex Rosenberg is a, a prime example. I think a particularly consistent materialist who looks to what physics talks about at the moment. And he says the fundamental particles are fermions and bosons. And he says that's the whole truth about reality. Everything else is an illusion. But the biggest illusion of all is time, okay? If you completely cut out the subjective way of thinking about things, okay, then you're not here in the present right now. This isn't the present. Because if you take the, the best models of time we have in physics, there is no present. There's no way of picking out this particular moment. Your life, if it's, if it's physically significant enough to even be counted as part of the ultimate reality, is a kind of string that begins when you're born and ends when you die, you know, and it's all there at the same time. And the idea that we're here at a particular moment is an illusion. Everything's an illusion. Do you know, that's a lot of illusion, man. It's too much illusion. I've got the illusory blues. Yeah, that's better. So I, uh, I used to be a materialist. I used to entirely believe, I thought, I thought that people who weren't materialists were kind of crazy. Um, I spent my whole time as a student, I did my PhD on materialism, trying to make more sense of it. Even when I got to Kiel, I was a materialist. And then you know what I realized? I realized I've been duped, tricked, conned, hoodwinked, okay? Um, and a part of it was when I started to actually look into the history of this, okay? The first materialist, the guy who invented it, well, his teacher's supposed to have invented it, but we only, we only know about him. Democritus, back in ancient Greece, said everything was atoms. But what was his conclusion? His conclusion was complete skepticism. He had the illusory blues too. A quote from Democritus, right? He says, Poor thought, do you take your warrants from us and then overthrow us? Our overthrow is your fall. He ends in complete skepticism. But then something happened with materialism in the course of history. So in the Roman period, you see Lucretius, um, a follower of Democritus and ever Atomist, seeing this as an essentially political view. It's against religion. If everything's just atoms, there can't be gods. Okay? It's a political stance. Now, if you look over the course of the history, this course of the history of philosophy, you see something actually very surprising, okay? Who are the, the biggest figures who you could call materialists, right? Well, maybe there's, maybe there's one or two in the 20th century we could mention, okay? But actually, the biggest figures in the history of philosophy who've, who've developed uh, materialism haven't been metaphysicians at all, mainly known as political philosophers, Hobbes and Marx, I think, are the main names, okay? It's a political doctrine. 
This is what Bertrand Russell said in 1925, before materialism came back. He said, at the present day, the chief protagonists of materialism are certain men of science in America and certain politicians in Russia, because it is in these two countries that traditional theology is powerful. Now, these two countries went on to dominate the world, of course. What have we got as our common sense? We've got Cold War metaphysics, essentially. Yeah? It was about breaking the power of religion. It was about gratitude to science and technology. Where were the arguments? Well, if you look back at this period, in the 1950s to the 60s, when materialism took over, there were none. It's not as if there were, there were bad arguments. There were no arguments. People started to be materialists. Even to this day, when people write about it, definitive articles, right? The main, ar the main argument which they have for materialism isn't, a, isn't an argument for materialism at all. It's an argument against dualism, a, a, a different view which you might take according to, a, to which the mind is a kind of immaterial object. If you look at the great philosophers after World War II, the vast majority have actually rejected materialism. Why? Because it presents an incoherent wor worldview and it doesn't answer any philosophical questions. It encourages anti-philosophy. It encourages us not asking questions that are of natural interest to people because we think that everything we think is an illusion anyway, that you can't understand any of this stuff without specialized equipment or, or um, you know, high-level mathematics. Why does any of that matter? Well, this is our view of ultimate reality. And what we're doing, if we focus solely on objective thought and ignore the subjective, is we're thinking of reality in terms of making and control we're thinking of reality as what we can do with that. And now we're even starting to think of ourselves in terms of material that we can manipulate and what we can do to it. We're not answering philosophical questions. Philosophical questions are dismissed as illusions. It degrades our lives. It turns our lives into illusions. It discourages thought. It encourages trust. And it takes us out of contact with our own realities the realities that matter to us. I got the illusory blues And man, it's got a scar I got the illusory blues Man, it's got a scar Because if your philosophy's rotten, what you gonna build on top? I'm going to uh, just talk for a little bit now. I'm sorry about that. As, you've, as I hope you've noticed, I'm uh, trying to make sure, well, my top priority is to ensure that everybody has a good time, which I hope you are. Great. OK. Um, so let me uh, continue. This is, this is a kind of lecture, OK? Um, let me talk about technology. This is a subject of uh, the book which I'm writing at the moment. Um, we live uh, among what I call ceaseless technological advance. Um, technology is always changing. It changes people's life. I, I use the word advance because ad, an advance is moving forward. It's not necessarily progress, right? Progress implies something good. It could be taking us back. Um, and we always have. I mean, this is a feature of human life. We use tools and we use our intelligence to create technology to make our lives better. But the fact that we live among ceaseless technological advance, I think, is particularly hard to miss in this current generation because all of us have seen... Um, even the youngsters here, right, have seen the changes that computers have brought to our lives. I think I was one of the first generations to grow up with computers, you know. I had a BBC, 32K. Um, uh, and now, I think probably most people in this room spend most of your working day sitting there looking at a computer or that, or you're looking on a mobile phone. Huge change, right? There are massive changes which are currently envisaged, okay? The the, the uh, technological advance is getting faster, it's accelerating. Um, and 
soon, maybe it will be driven by machines and not, not human beings. Um, now, this has happened to a certain extent ever since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, where a lot of the philosophical advocates of um, using science to change our lives and, and improve our conditions uh, would talk naturally about harnessing magic, about taking magic, uh, learning to wield magic ourselves for the betterment of human beings. Um, now, where you look at where you think when that's taken us, obviously it's made huge changes and massive improvements, and now a lot more of us living happier lives. But you have to remember, we've had some near misses incredibly recently. I mean, 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? Just absolute flukes, okay? We didn't have a full-on nuclear war. For instance, you know, uh, one example is of a Russian submarine captain who refused to fire a nuclear missile that two others were encouraging to, but it required three of them to do it. He wouldn't do it. Um, it would have almost certainly provoked a all that catastrophe. That could have been the end of us. That could have been the end of us. Um, you know, so we now have enormous power. We have this, this power to, to destroy ourselves with this technology. Um, but is it being guided rationally? Um, are, we, are we being careful how we develop this, uh, given that we live in a world with various historically entrenched troubles um, that were not the most peaceful um, species that's ever walked the earth? Um, I don't really think that's true. I mean, all around the world you hear about scientists racing to, dis to find the new next discovery. Um, you know, there's a race. Who can be the first out there? Um, do we think ethics panels can be trusted to hold back these things? Well, if you actually look at the history of what's happened, rarely. I mean, sometimes they slow down these developments. Um, what do you think would happen if somebody worked out a, a new way of manipulating subatomic matter which could create an even bigger bomb than, than, than uh, the nuclear bomb. Do you think they, they wouldn't publish that? I think somebody else wouldn't come along and do it in a different country if they were banned. But what is driving it? Well, a large part of what's driving this new technology is, as far as I can see, the arms industry. That's where lots of the big money goes in. That's where all the big money is going into artificial intelligence at the moment. Vladimir Putin recently said that whoever uh, controls artificial intelligence will rule the world. Um, and another part of it is the free market, okay? If we buy into things through advertising, peer pressure, etc., you know, we, encourage, we encourage that. Is that a, a wise way to, to you know, develop this power which could end all of our stories? Whatever you think about how we're using technology, I think everybody could agree that a complete end would be uh, pretty disastrous, um, the ultimate disaster. And another thing to remember is new tech gives us new powers, but it continually ages. Like nuclear weapons one day, right, we hope, will be something which is like Victorian technology or Georgian technology or medieval technology, right? How easy is it to get hold of any of that sort of stuff? Will we be here in a 1,000 years? Well, reading people write about uh, philosophy of technology, I'm always quite amused, maybe I've got a bad sense of humor, to see that uh, a common explanation which is put out there of why we've never, this, this has been going around for years now, decades, um, why have we not encountered alien life? Well, there are a lot of philosophers out there who think, you know, that when a species reaches a certain level of technological development, they inevitably destroy themselves. So the reason we haven't encountered any alien life is that the ones that got clever enough to contact, e contact us blew themselves up, you know? Uh, it's quite a, quite a depressing thought. You know, what, what, what's our situation with technology at the moment? Um, this seems, uh, I think we're in a state of what I call techno-paralysis. We, we look at these new developments which are coming, bio not biological manipulation of ourselves, artificial intelligence, and we sort of look at them as if they're meteors coming towards the earth, and we hope they're going to explode into roses, and we hope will be okay, you know. Um, you know, some people are worried and resigned to it, but, you know, we're not doing anything about it. Uh, technology is something which you can use for good or for bad. But ever since the Enlightenment, materialists have seen it as, as an inevitably benign force, you know, something which, um, you know, cannot help to, to help us out, you know. In a recent book called The Inevitable, um, Kevin Kelly, who was one of the pioneers of the Internet, um, he said, you know, you can't fight the forces of physics, you know. Certain technological developments will happen. It's just inevitable. So we just have to accept that, you know, artificial intelligence will probably put, out, put us out of jobs and cause great misery around the world. But, you know, that's all there is to it. You can't fight the physics. 
You know, I thought, I thought physicists were people who got up in the morning and brushed their teeth, you know. Apparently, it's a, apparently physics is a, is, a, is a force which is beyond our control. Um, Steven Pinker, uh, um, a psychologist, um, he thinks the meaning of life itself is to drive forward progress with science. He thinks that's the meaning of human existence. Um, at, against this, this backdrop, which I think materialism encourages, I'm going to tell you the story uh, from ancient Greece of the Titano, Titanomachy. Um, this was the war between the gods and the titans. The gods, the Greek gods, represented everything which was good and everything that was bad in human beings in an, an accentuated way. Um, the titans, on the other hand, represented the raw forces of nature, right? The raw forces of nature. Um, and they had a battle, and the gods won, and the gods saw that these forces needed to be controlled, so they buried the titans deep down at the bottom of the earth, um, underneath the earth. Um, and uh, one of the titans um, gave us fire. He gave us technology. And then throughout history, you have uh, warnings about uses of technology. So the story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the, the apple of knowledge, okay? Pandora's box, okay? Released uh, her curiosity, produced all these terrible things to us, for us. You know? Icarus, whose technological developments led to the death of his son by flying too close to the sun. Frankenstein in the recent era. The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Right? These, are, these are stories we've had throughout time. But I want to think now about uh, just the story of, of the Titans with the, with the gods trying to in, enclose the Titans. And we've got a song now uh, which is sung by a Titan.
So, that painted a bit of a, a, a dark portrait. Um, I want to bring in a little bit more optimism here. Um, you know, over the years, religion and science have often been at loggerheads. There have been some attempts to merge them, some rather notorious kind of religious science, um, sciences of religion, but you know, it's been a pretty serious business at the one um, over the years. Uh, when religion was in charge, you could get burnt at the stake by saying the wrong thing in science. Um, communist Russia, you were in big trouble if you were in the church. Um, so they've often had major, major battles, but actually they have a lot in common. Okay, they have a lot in common in the sense that they both offer closure. They offer answers. That's it. That's the answer to your question. Okay. Um, if you were curious about this, we have an answer here, and we have experts, whether it be the priests or the scientists. They give you, they give you closure. People like closure. Now, philosophy which is, in a sense, somewhere positioned between um, religion and science, doesn't offer you closure. It offers you openness. Um, it asks questions, and it doesn't necessarily give you answers, but it, gives, it encourages you to take up a view on those positions. Now, um, materials have often used this against uh, philosophy. They've said, uh, you know, philosophers have been asking these questions for two and a half thousand years and they still haven't got any answers. How useless. Let's get rid of, let's get rid of philosophy. We've been hearing that for a couple of hundred years now. Um, but that completely misses the point, right? That's actually entirely successful. That's complete success for philosophy. We managed to keep a conversation open over two and a half thousand years. Right? We managed to keep an open conversation on these questions. We didn't exhaust the possibilities. We had different rational perspectives being on them. It got people to think. It kept people's minds open. Right? And they still do. We can refresh these problems for the present day, and people can still encourage this openness, this thinking about the world. Now, this is what we need, it seems to me, if we've got any chance of addressing ceaseless technological advance. We need openness. We need people to, to think about big issues, to not think, oh, well, there are experts out there who know the answers, right? But rather to, to form your own rational opinion, right? If there are experts who know things that you don't, right, you'd be pretty foolish not to listen to them. On the other hand, right, you can still have a position on a view which you thought out, which you think that's true. It's openness, right? Don't expect it to just be closed off and then you don't have to think about it. Now, if we're going to address something like ceaseless technological advance, we need to think about reality on a grand scale. We need to be used to thinking about these things, okay? We need to be thinking metaphysically about the whole world, about what we're doing, about the meaning of life, if you like, okay? About what human beings are doing. Um, and this isn't going to be solved top-down. I mean, if somebody of the status of Stephen Hawking, who's a scientist, who obviously very important in our uh, in the kind of sort of materialist culture we have, can think that, you know, artificial intelligence is inevitably going to spell the doom of, of humanity, which he did, and it makes not the blindest bit of difference. That's not going to work. It can't be top-down. It's got to be, be bottom-up. We've got to have people, ordinary people, thinking about philosophy. It can't be an issue which is just for the elite, which is, to be honest, essentially what it's been throughout, this, throughout its history. Um, so that's how I think you can possibly do something to address this question. Universal philosophical education from an early age when children at the age of four, you know, they ask these questions. They're interested in philosophical questions and it's tended to be closed down. We're told that there are answers. We're, we're, we're given closure in it. Instead of encouraging openness, we expect, we expect you to say what the answer is, you know. Um, you know, some, if, 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 if your kid asks you, you know, why the world exists, you shouldn't just close that line of questioning down, right? You just say, great, you've joined a line of questioning which many great people have, 
have been involved in over the years, and there are various different ways you can think about it. While materialists tend to disagree with me on this, lots of materialists think that we're doomed and we need to do something about technology, but they've got a different solution. Theirs is totalitarian. They say, we adjust ourselves. Human beings aren't good enough to deal, and this is a standard materialist response, we're not good enough to deal with the new technological power we're creating. So we have to adjust ourselves, we have to morally enhance ourselves, you know. Have to have some brain surgery to make us think what somebody who thinks that moral enhancement and forced surgery on our brains is a good idea, right? We're going to get their conception of morality, no thanks. Um, so that's the view that I, that, I, that I think is the only way we could do this, some sort of bottom-up uh, um, approach where, whereby people, including the scientists, the technologists, the business people, okay, are kind of used to thinking about philosophical issues from an, uh, from an early age. We've got to stop thinking it's outside of our control, that it's built into the atoms, because that's a false metaphysic anyway. I mean, I think any philosopher should realise once they say that there's never actually any argument for it, you know, philosophy should always be based on reasons. If there are answers we have to
Cause printable objects make lots of money Are you just a robot that you can buy all your jeans? Well, if you're not, then don't be a cog in the machine We all have lives that are very different We rarely stop to consider what's outside But if you're blind to the bigger picture Then you're a pawn in a game they want to hide but if you think, discover the link, and you'll see where we're headed today. Technology is blind, so we gotta find the philosophy of soul. Okay, well, I told you I was going to tell you the meaning of life, so I'm about to tell you the meaning of life. It's about to come. Not much longer. Okay, so it's a good question. It's a very good question, right? What is the meaning of life? What is, what, what is that asking? Well, it's asking, why do human, ex human beings exist? Why are we here, right? Okay, this must be something that everybody's thought about. You know, why, why am I even here at all, right? And okay, a question, the answer to that wouldn't be, you know, well my parents met, et cetera, right? Because that's going to push the question back a stage or there was a process of evolution. That's going to push the, back ex the question back a stage. You know, why is there anything at all? That's the, big, that's the big question, right? And is there a reason that there's everything at all which gives us a reason to act a certain way in our lives? Uh, you know, some reason to do this or do that, okay? Well, it seems to me there are four options you can possibly take on this question. Um, the first one is that there is a meaning of life, okay, and it's a good meaning. Uh, most religions um, will, will tell you this, okay, so this is, this is, if you like, the standard answer, right? So we were created for a purpose, and if we live good lives, we'll be rewarded, and, you know, why does reality exist? Well, we're not supposed to ask that, because maybe the nature of God is self-explanatory, if you understood it, or something like that. Okay, so that's one option. Another option is that there is a meaning of life and it's a bad one. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to suffer. Um, there's not very much we can do about it. There have been various misery gutses in the history of philosophy of thought, something like that. Okay, so that's another option. Uh, a third option is there is a meaning of life as a reason for the whole of reality being here, um, but it's pretty much neutral as far as human beings are concerned, right? So there's a reason for reality, but it doesn't really tell human beings whether they should do this or that, okay? We're, we're kind of irrelevant, okay? Um, not all, not those three answers don't, uh, don't require the existence of God, but, you know, nevertheless, some kind of creator would make an awful lot of sense, and it's a standard answer if, if there's some meaning built into reality, Okay? Uh, the fourth possible answer you could give is that there is no meaning of life, okay? Um, this would be a perfectly reasonable answer to the question. If I said, what's the biggest elephant in this room, okay? And you said, there isn't an elephant in this room, that would be a perfectly reasonable answer to a question in that form, right? So what the answer to the question of meaning of life might be that there isn't a meaning of life, okay? Um, but note, if that were the answer, okay, it would be different from the other three, okay? Because if there is no meaning... Right? If there is no meaning, then this is just a fact. It wouldn't be an evaluation anymore, right? Because in order for an evaluation to say things are good or things are bad, okay, you need the meaning to be built into the nature of reality, okay? But if there was no meaning of life, uh, religious traditions have, have, have uh, prepared us for the idea that um, a meaningless life would be a bad one because you're not following the meaning that God set in in, in stone, or you're, maybe perhaps you're not following Stephen Pinker's meaning of life, of trying to make the world better with science, okay? But if there is no meaning of life, this wouldn't be a bad thing, it wouldn't be a good thing, it would be a neutral, entirely neutral thing. Um, as I like to think of it, we'd be here with nothing to do, okay? Why would that be a concern? It wouldn't, so long as there's lots of things that we want to do, okay? That's just a fact about it, there might be lots of things we want to do, okay? So, uh, I'm now going to reveal which of those four answers um, I believe, okay? But because this is philosophy, because it's about openness, right, okay, I don't expect to have persuaded you in those few words. Why the hell would I? You could read my book, okay? Um, I don't expect to have persuaded you at all, right? So, I, so I'm going to give you two options on the screen. Right? I'll tell you when you need to sing. We're going to sing it three times, okay? The white is what I think. 
the yellow might be what you think, right? So in the, in the, in the spirit of how the House of Commons is at the moment, right? If, in order to get your message across, sing louder, okay? Make sure you sing as loud as you, as you possibly can, okay? Um, so here we go. You're finally going to get the answer, right? But remember, it's just my answer because philosophy is about openness. We don't want bloody closure. We don't want to be told the answer and then it all goes away and we move on to the next thing, right? We don't want to just keep dragging on, keep going, keep forward and, you know, not quite sure where the hell we're heading. We want to think things through. Let's go. Life is meaningless, and I don't care. 